hang on for a minute it's not the it's not the be all and end all we've learned to respect ourselves a little bit more haven't we and hear the birds sing so today on someone you should meet we're in the uk as part of our series where we check in with people across the globe just to see how the coronavirus is impacting on their lives and today i am thrilled to be speaking with my old friend tv and radio presenter pat sharp hi pat well hi claire how are you doing you okay i'm doing great love thank you how about you well yeah when you mentioned that you know the coronavirus obviously is rife around the world i suppose i should be grateful that i'm well so yes i am good and what about the family are they well too yes um they are our daughter uh, charlotte she did have the coronavirus she tested positive for it and uh, that was about five or six weeks ago and um, oh, yeah she went for a test her husband took her for one of the private tests that you can get and um, it came up positive i mean she was very ill she was uh, you know sort of 10 days without being able to lift her head off the pillow and was in a terrible state but um, you know she's she's recovered well and she's absolutely fine and and, uh, and and everything's good but she was i guess one of the lucky ones you know she's young and uh, didn't have any underlying health issues so she's okay but that's scary because charlotte is young she's still in her 20s isn't she yep she's 20 27 28 something like that yeah 28 so so what were her symptoms pat basically um the first thing was the loss of taste and smell um, and that was followed by literally the worst headache and, and coughing and like a, just a terrible, like it's like an awful flu. And, you know, she just felt so ill and, um, and couldn't move her head off the pillow, as I said. So really, she needed to do something about that. And um, so that's why they went and had a test. But once you had the test and they say you've got it, then what do you do? You just go, well, I've got it. But you just hope that you don't have to put a burden on the NHS here and obviously go to hospital, which she didn't. But um, she she has had it. But then now people are saying, you know, some people are saying that you can get it again. There's just so many things that are not positive, as in not positive tests, but as in absolutely positive responses. So can you get it again? Oh, no, you can't. Oh, hang on a minute, maybe you can. So that's the problem. Everybody is like not quite sure about anything. So she's now worried that she might get it again because she was really very, very ill and it really, uh, you know, ruined her sort of 10 days of her life. But compared to what's happened to other people, she's had a right result. There's, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people around the world have obviously lost their lives and then there's families impacted from that. So it's horrendous and it's just such a major impact on everybody's lives. As, as you'll know, from, you must know somebody who's, who's definitely had it or knows somebody who knows somebody. Yeah, it's just crazy. Um, I'm so glad that she's on the mend, but what's the process there right now? So if you, you know, test positive for the symptoms or you think you've got the symptoms, like what is the process? <laughs> I think the process is, is that the only reason she tested positive was because her husband paid for a test, paid £375 with a private doctor to have her tested. So if you feel you have the symptoms, but you don't go to hospital, you're not going to know that you've had it. You might just have flu. I think a lot of people have had this virus um, in certainly early February, late January, and they just thought they had horrendous flu and they didn't bother to get a test because at the time they weren't even aware that this was going to be what it became as in the pandemic. So they just thought they had a very bad flu. Yes, that's say again? Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's yeah, it what it is, Craig, yeah. You know, people, Sorry, I was just going to say, it's funny you mentioned that because I think more and more people are thinking back to kind of like early January, late December, when, you know, a lot of people I know were feeling really unwell and they just couldn't shake off this heavy cold, you know, for like four, five, six weeks. And looking back, it does make you wonder, doesn't it? Was that coronavirus? It probably was. It was probably a, a mild form and um, people just got on with it because they weren't really aware of what coronavirus was at the time. So therefore... They just, as you say, made the, the best of what they had and perhaps took time off work, perhaps rested. But I know there's a guy um, I work with who you'll remember um, and know from, from British radio is uh, Toby Anstis. And Toby, uh, who was on Heart for many years. Yes, I met Tony once. I, I came to visit you at Heart and he was there. Yes, yeah. Okay. He was a nice so, guy. Yeah, so one of the um, house stations is on their heart dance. He, he does the breakfast show. But if you look back at Toby's Twitter 
um, on February the 2nd, because I was speaking to him about this, on February the 2nd, he's posted a picture on his Twitter, and there's a picture of him like this, taking a selfie like this, in, in bed, saying, I have never, ever felt so ill. I haven't moved from this bed for 48 hours. I've just sweated, and I don't know what's wrong with me, and I've never had flu like this in my life. I'm so ill. He, he, he definitely had coronavirus, but he just didn't realise that's what it was. Uh, he, did, he didn't have you know, a name that everybody was talking about yet. And I'm sure there's many other people who've been in the same, uh, same boat. You know, it's what's kind of frightening, just speaking to you right now about it, we're not talking about like elderly people here. And because at the beginning, I think we were all kind of led to believe that this was an older person's virus. But, you know, the fact that you mentioned your daughter and Tony, I mean, at Toby rather, these are just, you know, these aren't old people. And so it's, yeah, it really kind of makes you, um, you know, want to take kind of extra precautions really, doesn't it? Well, yeah, I don't know what precautions you can take apart from just being safe and staying at home, which is what they're telling you to do, isn't it? So I think if you're suddenly going to find yourself running around, you know, like people have been about, I read in the papers today, lots of market stalls and various shops starting to open and people sitting on park benches and running around on bicycles and mixing and, you know, so on and so forth. You're probably asking for trouble, whatever age you are. So I wouldn't want to catch this illness, this disease. I wouldn't want to put a burden on the NHS. And I certainly wouldn't want to have it myself because it's horrendous. And you read about people who are, you know, considerably younger than, than you and I, certainly even younger than you, <laughs> let alone me. And they are, um, you know, they're, they're in terrible trouble. So I think, um, yeah, you should really look after yourself, as you say, and take precautions, definitely, because... It, it, it could happen to you and I think people just think ah, I'll be fine I'm I'm young and I'm cool and I'm fit and I've got a few quid so I might as well just go out and have a good time and you know take a take a by ride with my friends and, and meet up illegally but it's, it's not a good idea because that will mean that we'll never get out of this it'll be a permanent uh, disease that just keeps on spreading we just have to carry on staying at home we do. I know here certain states um, are starting to gradually reopen certain things, not here in California, um, although in the neighbouring county, the beach has just opened there. Um, but our beaches are closed. You know, anything that um, could kind of facilitate a public gathering is closed. And um, what about where you are? Because you are, are you still um, in the same place that, that you were living when, when I last saw you, just outside of London? We're in North London, yeah, in uh, yeah. in Hertfordshire, in Hertfordshire now, a little bit further out, a bit more, a bit more leafy. We moved oh, up, we moved a bit up. more rural. Have you got a village pub, Pat? Um, yeah, there are a few pubs actually, but obviously nothing open at the moment. But then again, I'm a non-drinker, so I'm quite boring. But uh, we'd be going uh, to the pub. But my missus would. She'd be in the pub. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. I'm going to ask you about Monica in a, in a minute, actually, because she's originally from Norway, isn't she? And I want to chat to you about, um, you know, Absolutely. what situation's like there. But so going back to where you live in your village in Hertfordshire, um, what's the um, situation at the shops? I mean, can you get everything? Are you, um, you know, is there certain stuff that they've just sold out of? There were things. You probably heard about the lack of uh, toilet paper at one stage. There was uh, panic buying for loo rolls. So that was not ideal. But then again, we never really noticed too much difference because we weren't greedy and we didn't go and hoard stuff. You know, when we needed something, we go to the supermarket, you stand in line, you wait your turn, you go inside, you walk around, you respect uh, distances with other people. And from that, you pick up the goods you want and come home. And I think if everybody just did what they needed to do without having to go completely crazy and, uh, you know, get more and more things that then mean that they're out of stock for other people, then it would be more sensible. So we haven't had any problems with that, but we've been very, very good at staying at home because there is, there is no point in trying to flout the rules because the rules are there to help us get out of the rules. So if you flout them, they'll just go on forever. We'll just be here in a year's time or 18 months time. So the whole idea is just to go out as little as you can. Don't go to the supermarket every day and do a little shop. Do one big one and, and go and get some meat from the butcher if you eat meat. And, uh, you know, get a load and freeze it and then go back in 10 days' time. But people are, uh, you know, I see, I see more and more people now out on the roads and uh, I see people 
uh, when I'm walking the dog, I get people jogging up behind me too close and, you know, wheezing and spluttering and I'm going, whoa. It's, it's almost as if some people just don't get it, you know? And um, Pat, have you got to wear masks over there? Because I know that we're strongly encouraged to wear them now when we leave the house and we have to wear them if we're going inside like a grocery store. We don't have to. It's not compulsory. But I think a lot of people do. And I have done when I've been out. But I don't know how good they are. And you still hear things from people saying that they might not be um, totally beneficial to the person who is wearing them. In other words, the person who's wearing it could still get coronavirus, but will hopefully, if they have coronavirus, stop spreading it because they're wearing a mask. So don't go out with a mask just to save yourself because you might still apparently get it. They're not 100% guaranteed, uh, but they are a lot, uh, apparently a lot more useful if, if somebody has coronavirus and doesn't know they have it, just small symptoms then apparently if they're breathing on somebody, then uh, the mask will help them not spread it. So, but then again, you hear conflicting reports every day, don't you, wherever you are in the world about what this disease is, because I don't think anybody really knows. I think we're all, we're all learning, governments are learning day by day. You know, three months ago, we never even heard the word. It's just crazy. I mean, our lives have been literally turned upside down, but the main thing is that, you know, thankfully we're, we're kind of safe and well right now. Um, Talk to you about the NHS because I'm loving seeing all the videos and posts on Facebook of you know my friends and family back home. Um, eight eight o'clock every Thursday, they you know stand outside the house or wave through the windows and they clap for the NHS. And um, what is the feeling toward the NHS like in the UK right now? It's total love and um, admiration. People think they are lifesavers they are the florence nightingales of today they're saving everybody from uh, the terror of catching this disease because people think that if i do catch it at least i've got a chance of survival because these guys are just amazing at what they do with their long shifts and the fact that they not particularly well paid many of them and they are risking their own lives to save others and as you know uh, a few members, sadly, of the NHS have lost their lives, saving other people's lives. And uh, same goes for other key workers like um, bus drivers and people on London transport have lost their lives as well by driving people around and, and therefore catching the virus. So but the NHS themselves, they really, you know, when people go outside and, and clap and, and uh, you know, rattle pots and pans and stuff like this, it, it's, it's because we have such a love and admiration for what they're doing because they are very brave and um, extremely efficient at their jobs and um, without them we would be in in real dire straits i mean they've managed to keep it there and thereabouts i heard today that there is there are there is room in hospitals for other people who now are catching coronavirus it didn't thanks to the public and most people adhering to the rules, it didn't go over the top and, uh, and completely um, overflow the NHS. So um, they, they are able to take on more people and they're continuing to work hard and long shifts to look after people who are sick. Pat, for our American friends that might be watching this, um, talk to me about the NHS. Tell me a little bit about you know, how it works, because obviously we don't have such a thing here. Well, do you still have Obamacare and does that work? Is that what? So, yeah, you can get, um, so yes, there, there is a form of Obamacare here, but obviously it's not, it's nothing like the NHS, um, you know, even still. Um, so you have to qualify for um, the Obamacare, if you like, um, to start with. And then, you know, sometimes, depending what health um, insurance policy you've got, the, the co-payments are outrageous. So, you know, Having lived, obviously, in the UK for most of my life, and now I'm living here, um, I, for one, really appreciate the NHS because, you know, you don't really think twice about phoning up and making a doctor's appointment. Um, even if it's an emergency, calling an ambulance, well, you think twice about doing any of those things here. Um, so, you know, just, you know, how important is the NHS right now to people in the UK? 
Well, in that case, from what you just told me, it's, in, it's incredibly important because obviously of coronavirus, it means that if you are unwell, you can literally get yourself to a hospital and, um, and get yourself checked in and hopefully looked after and hopefully recover as Boris Johnson did. He went through the NHS system. He didn't have any private treatment. It was the NHS who looked after him. And also, even if there was a coronavirus and you just have a regular problem, you have a heart problem, you have a cancer problem, you have something terrible happen to you that is, uh, you know, required uh, for medical assistance, then the NHS will do a better job in a way than private surgeons. For example, you know, I had an issue a few years ago and I went, because I had medical insurance, I went to a private doctor who then put me on to a private specialist and so on and so forth. But when it got to the stage of actually looking further into my issue, the private specialist suggested that he would transfer me over to the NHS because they had better equipment and better people to do the work. So they really are an amazing organization. And to think that you can go there and be covered uh, for free, just because, well, I say for free, it's part of your, you know, your taxes and everything yeah. else, obviously. But to know that, that, that it's there for you and that you can call an ambulance. I mean, my mom, you know, she's 90 and um, she lives in a care home uh, up the road and she's, she's got all her marbles. She's very switched on. She knows what's going on. She just needs assistance being 90. She needs someone to bath her and to get her dressed and to look after her and make sure that she's, uh, you know, able to get around and get a meal because she can't live by herself anymore. And... Um, but, you know, there's been a couple of times where an ambulance has come to her care home for her because she's been struggling with breathing or whatever. And, um, you know, it just comes. And I feel so, you know, when the care home phones me and says, oh, we've just found an ambulance for your mum because we're there, we need someone professional to take a look at her because we're only, we're only care home staff, I know that she is going to be immediately looked after. And they are so thorough in the way that they deal with people. They come in with all this equipment, mobile equipment, and they set up a computer and they plug her in with these wires and they do this and do that. And you just sit there going like this going, wow, this is great. And it is, it's, it's, it's something that money can't buy and you're getting it really for free. And they're just doing it for you, for everybody in this whole country. Whenever you need something, they'll look after you. And that's why it's an amazing thing to have. And uh, I'm sure something that, uh, along with our royal family, the Americans will be very jealous of not having. <laughs> Although, um, I think we've got Harry and Meghan in LA, so <laughs> we've got a bit of that right now. Um, yeah, but they're, they're, not, uh, they're, not, they're not royals anymore, you see. Well, they're not, no, no, they've dropped their title, so uh, they're just kind of commoners now, Pat. So, um, but your mum, it was her birthday, wasn't it, recently? I saw her on Facebook. Oh, yes, yes, she turned 90, and that was the ironic thing, actually, to do with the coronavirus, because we're pretty sure that my mum had this virus, because... She turned 90 and we were going to obviously take her out and you know, everyone was going to take her out for a nice meal and spoil her. And she literally, a couple of days before her 90th birthday, she, she struggled in the care home. And that's when the NHS, the NHS ambulance service came and, and took her into the hospital. And she was struggling to breathe. They gave her oxygen. And I'm pretty sure she had a, a mild strain of coronavirus. So, yeah, so she, she, she had a birthday out of the hospital that wasn't able to go out and uh, have a meal, but um, she's, she's doing all right now. But yeah, she's turned 90, but it was the NHS uh, that definitely saved her. They definitely looked after her. And within five days of being on some fluids and, you know, uh, drips and stuff, uh, she, she returned back to the care home as, as fit as a 90 year old can be. And she's quite good. She doesn't even take a blood pressure pill and she's 90. Wow. You got to see her on a birthday though, didn't you? Yep, yeah, yeah, that was the picture I think you saw. We we spoke yeah. with, with a big ninety balloon. And uh but, yeah. did you actually physically see her or was it just like through the window? Uh on her birthday we did physically see her because they hadn't been that was only February the seventeenth, so there hadn't been any type of lockdown by then. Yeah, so we were fine. It was Mother's Day when I got to see her through the window. Oh, and what's the situation like with her care homes? I know some care homes over here have been overrun with coronavirus, unfortunately. Um, have any other residents contracted it there or you know, how worried are you about that? Yes, uh, they have. Six people have sadly died and in many care homes in the UK, and I'm sure where you are too, it's the same. 
so it's quite a, a tough situation but all the uh, the elderly people like my mum have all been uh, kept in their rooms so they're in their rooms and they're being kept in there but obviously people have to come into their rooms and you know wash them and uh, in food and stuff and look after them but they're not allowed out of their rooms they don't go to the dining room or to the activity room or do anything so she has to walk around her room with a Zimmer frame, which isn't very large. So she can go, go to the door and back again. So it's tough. But I think Have she's... Have you thought about bringing her home and like having her at your house? Well, technically, I can't. I wouldn't be allowed. Because one, I can't get into her care home because it's locked down. Two, you're not allowed to bring people into your home when they're not part of your family. And she hasn't been living here, so therefore she's not part of her family. And three, we are not trained in looking after a 90 year old woman who needs a lot of assistance. That's why she's been in a care home for many years. So no, we can't do that. And, and if she did come out of there, she might be less safe than where she is. And she might end up catching the virus or something else, you know, on the way here or even here from us. We don't know that we haven't got it, do we? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I know my mum and dad are in a similar situation back in the UK. My granddad's 95, 96 now. He lives on his own, but he has carers come into the house. Um, and they're of the same mindset that he's actually safer where he is. He doesn't see very many people. He's kind of isolated. Although my parents do actually still visit him, I think three times a week um, to care for him. So yeah, it's, um, it is a bit of a dilemma. And um, tell me about Nicky, your eldest son, though, because he's across the pond. He's in New York, isn't he? Well, he is technically a new a New Yorker, but they have been his wife and their daughter have, and their dog have been in Florida for about six weeks because literally they they um, as soon as the pandemic um, started and New York became the epicenter of this, as you know, they yeah. literally whoosh, got out of there. He works in recruitment, so he's able to work remotely, and um, they got away from there and they've been renting an airbnb in uh, fort lauderdale now for many weeks and they're there feeling a lot safer than if they were in new york oh my gosh so that's totally turned their lives upside down then hasn't it totally yeah absolutely but, but this has turned everybody's life upside down hasn't it i don't see how anybody could actually be saying that i mean there, i guess there are a few people and a few companies that are probably making better money out of out of this including um uh, things like video chats uh, like we're using now they're probably <laughs> more subscribers and, and Netflix as well and so on and so forth but in general I think it's affected everybody uh, both mentally and, uh, and physically for work and stuff it's just a complete and utter turntable isn't it it totally is I mean how's it impacting your work well dramatically Claire I mean I've uh, I had 68 uh, live gigs, DJ sets, festival hostings, call them whatever you want. 68 appearances booked in between now and November or last month of November and every single one has been cancelled because my work is all involved around large gatherings, you know, crowds of 3,000 to 30,000 and um, I can't obviously do anything with those crowds because those crowds aren't allowed to be mixing so there won't be any crowds so there won't be any festivals this summer everything's cancelled from the grand national to the boat race to glastonbury to the euros to the olympics to wimbledon there is nothing is there so you know it, it's the same around the world so it's very much affected i still do my radio shows i'm on greatest hits radio every saturday and sunday uh that's across the uk which is great and i can do that from my home and also do a show on uh, a national station in norway called Get the Bottom. So I was on there today a little bit earlier, but um, it's it's impacted it. But also, I think it's it's interesting to note that when this is happening and you're not working and not earning as much, you're also not out, so therefore you're not spending as much. So it's not it's not swings and roundabouts, but it's certainly um, it, it's certainly worth hanging on for everything to get better, so that you know you can return in 2021 and uh, make some make some money but i don't think making money is what's on everybody's mind at the moment it's just kind of almost it's like being in a movie what's on my mind is getting through this and and the people i know and love getting through it as well you know you know it's so funny you said it's like a movie i've said this many times i feel like i'm going to wake up go to sleep wake up the next day and this won't have been real 
you know, the kids will still be in school. I'll still be doing my normal thing. My mom and dad will still be coming over here. Um, and it's just, it's like, it, so what, you know, I don't want to be dramatic, but it's a bit like a living nightmare some days. Um, what are the positives though? What are the positives you are finding in this situation? Well, the positives I'm finding is probably the same as most people. The fact that I'm spending more time with my wife, my dog, my uh, my son Daniel, who lives with us still, and equally fresh air and um, uh, nature, and just not really thinking straight away. I must do this. I must earn this. I must be there. I've got to do this. What's my next appointment? I'm just kind of a bit more chilled and get up a little bit later and. Um, uh, if I want to take a nap, I will, and um, I don't feel sort of so bad about chilling almost. Uh, you know, I, I miss my work because I enjoy my work, and um, it's not everybody in life enjoys their job, but I, I'm quite lucky that I do. But I, I have learned to be a little more, as I say, chill, and I think when this is over, I won't make um, work and everything I do a complete priority. I'll try and remember that it's really important to to get a walk and to uh, you know get a bit more exercise and a bit more fresh air and to let other things just hang on for a minute. It's not the it's not the be all and end all. We've learned to respect ourselves a little bit more, haven't we? And hear the birds sing. So Pat, tell me about your wife Monica, because she's originally from Norway, isn't she? Absolutely. Yeah, so how are they getting on over there? Well, it's very small in Norway. The amount of people who, um, who have it is very small. I think there's about a hundred and sixty people who have uh, lost their lives. So it's it's a lot smaller than the UK. But then again, there's a lot less people. There's five million people in Norway, and it's about three times the size of Britain. But I think they are coping with it quite well, and um, the country are very good at um, adhering to the restrictions. So from what I hear from her parents and her brother and his wife and their kids, it's uh, it's just something that they're just dealing with. I think that's why they've had um, very few people actually um, you know, spreading the virus. What do you think we can learn here in the States from countries like Norway or certainly in the UK? Is there anything that we could be doing that we're not doing that seems to be working for you guys? Well, I don't know if you're asking the right person with me being a humble DJ, presenter, whatever. I mean, I'm not a... Well, we'll get on to that in a bit. I don't think humble is the right word, but yes, carry on. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not, I'm not a scientist, so I couldn't really tell you what you should be doing. Uh, maybe perhaps not listening to Trump telling you to inject yourselves with disinfectant. Yeah, maybe uh, downing the bleach isn't uh, the best thing to be doing right now, for sure. Um, but going back to Monica, um, you two have been married for years, but she's also your, your personal secretary, your, your personal assistant, your PA. How does that work? Like being married to someone and working with someone, how do you both not kill each other? Well, I'm sure she probably wants to kill me just from being married to me for 34 years. But I think at the end of the day, it works really well. Because she knows exactly what I will do and what I won't do. So when I get a request in to do something, she'll just go, he's not going to do it. <laughs> he just won't do it because she knows me so well. What sort, say, of things would you, what sort of things would you turn down then? Well, for me, I'd probably turn down the likes of the equivalent of Big Brother, even though we don't have it anymore. Um, I've got no interest at all in pretending to be, I don't know, some sort of uh, celebrity and, um, you know, running around with a jock strap and a bowler hat just to please TV viewers. I don't have, uh, I don't have a care in the world. I'm very happy with what I do for a living, so I don't really need to do those things. So you she knows have, when... You've done um, stuff like that before. They're like celebrity, I'm a celebrity. Yeah, but that's different because that's yeah. a really big show, the biggest reality show, and I loved every minute of it. And also, I have to say, though, isn't it, as an example to the question you asked me, I've been asked to do The Jungle. I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, a number of times, and said no. And then it was Monica who turned around and said, we will do it, because she wanted to go to Australia and stay in the Versace Hotel and fly business class. 
Oh my God, that's hilarious. Well, listen, for our American um, viewers who may not be familiar with that show, um, so the, the basically the theme is that um, the show gets a bunch of celebrities and takes you to a jungle in Australia and you have to basically fend for yourselves and do, um, you know, challenges and, you know, which generally involve like disgusting insects and whatever else. And um, so what was your most um, extreme experience during that show? Probably, to be honest with you, the not so much the challenges and, and having a you know a crocodile chase after you, or a little alligator, or whatever it was, or having to down your head in thousands of cockroaches and, and <laughs> millions of things like that. It, it wasn't those kind of things. The biggest, the hardest thing is is being stuck there for two, three weeks and living on bare rations, rice and beans, and um, it's a very tough time because you're with a bunch of people who some you'll get on with, some you won't, and you just have to learn to uh, have a new style of life and get up and go and collect blogs. And, uh, and uh, the, the problem with the show is, not the problem, why they do it, is that it's not all about the tasks that you mentioned and all about being on this great show it's about the boredom between the things that you're going to be doing or chosen to do by the public so you might wait for 10 12 14 hours maybe two days three days before you do anything and it's the boredom that actually drives you mad and then makes you start to say things that perhaps you shouldn't be saying so that's interesting how has that experience helped you during this experience because we're kind of in i know we're not in the middle of the australian jungle necessarily but, you know, we can't go out of the house. You know, a lot of us are bored. We, we can't do what we would usually do in life. So how are you drawing on that experience right now? Well, what we do, we, we often have um, meetings and chats with our friends. We go on Zoom and um, we put ourselves up on the uh, up on the TV and um, we just have a night in. And we grab a drink and uh, we chat with our friends and, and just sometimes have a bit of banter together and then afterwards you know when you spoke for two or three hours you suddenly think to yourself oh, it was nice to see them but you didn't really see them but it's as close as we're going to get so that's what we have been doing but also we've been very busy on diy we've painted things that didn't even need painting and um we have uh, done lots of bits and bobs around the house which have been quite good but i keep looking at my car it just sits in the driveway and i love my car i love driving my car and i love going long journeys and using it for work and, and getting to my gigs and doing everything i do so uh, it's a bit disappointing when it just sits there and you look at it getting dusty have you still got your registration plate the uh, pat one <laughs> no no i grew out of i grew out of ostentatious silly things like that no no. Well, no, no, one, no one would have known that it was you with that registration plate, huh? Yeah, I think that the problem was is that lorry drivers used to shout out, there's an R missing from Pratt. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Oh my gosh. Well, listen, I want to talk to you about your career because, as I said, you know, a lot of the people watching this are from the US, so they may not be familiar with your many talents. Um, take me right back to the, be the beginning because you started off in radio, didn't you? Absolutely, yeah. I was 20 years old and got a shot on uh, the BBC National Pop Music Station called Radio One. So I was uh, the youngest ever Radio One DJ to this day. And um, I managed to move from there to um, Radio Luxembourg and then on to Capital Radio and to Heart and Smooth and British Forces Broadcasting and uh, various other stations. I'm now at Greatest Hits Radio. So I've had a, a nice sort of 36 years on the radio. Um, um, around the world as well as doing in-flight entertainment for uh, Swiss Air and Virgin and uh, Sabina and various other airlines. So I've always been sort of broadcasting um, and then ended up getting TV shows from that. So done quite a bit of television as well as a presenter. So yeah, I'm quite blessed in that respect to have had such a long career and for it still to be going. In fact, in a way, it's probably flourishing even better now than it ever has done. Not necessarily from radio and television, but from the fact that I do so many live appearances and I've become sort of, um, by doing it so long, a bit of cult status with people. Like they, they go, uh, if someone sees me in a gig, they'll come up and say, you made my childhood because I did kids TV for 
13 years and uh, people feel that they grew up with me, which is a very uh, amazing accolade to, uh, to have aimed at you and people to say it's fantastic. And you know what, I kind of did too, because you and I met when I was 15, we met through a family friend and you, um, I don't know whether I ever told you this, Pat, but honestly, you've been a mentor to me throughout all these years. You took me to your studio, you showed me what you did, um, you kind of reinforced my desire to work in TV, and you very kindly kept in touch with me, you know, during the years. Um, so I feel like I've grown up with you too, um, but I've been particularly blessed to have you as a bit of a mentor. Um, but one of the standout shows that you'll always be remembered for in the UK is at Funhouse, um, which again, to our American friends, um, tell us kind of what the concept was with Funhouse. Well, American, I thank you for your kind words, by the way, it's very much appreciated. Um, the, the Americans should know Funhouse because the British version, the show that I did for many years here, came from the American show. So it was, it was actually a show in America first. Uh, it was called Funhouse, and it was hosted by a guy called J.D. Roth. And J.D. Roth was the host of the show, I think, in 1986, 87, something like that. Certainly, um, maybe even a bit longer, into 88, 89. But then I think there was only two, three, maybe four series of Funhouse in America. And I think it was on Fox. Uh, and um, in the UK, it ran, uh, it's a messy Gunji kids game show. And uh, if you want to Google it, you'll, you'll see it with JD Roth or with me. And uh, we had um, twin cheerleaders and they were dressed in red and yellow. We used to shake pom poms like this. And there would be um, uh, two teams, girl boy, girl boy from uh, different schools. And they would um, drive go-karts around the studio and play messy games and end up running through this giant funhouse to grab prizes and uh, hopefully get away with the big power prize at the end, which was normally a fantastic trip or something. So it was a great show. And it was obviously in the days when there were, certainly here in the UK, only four TV channels. So we had audiences on a Friday afternoon at five o'clock of around about 11 million people. And uh, that was for the best part of about 10, 12 years. So it did leave people with a, a firm print in their mind of, of, uh, of a TV show that they grew up with. Whereas now you could say to a kid, oh, you know, what are you watching on kids TV? And they'll go, oh, I don't know, Nickelodeon, Disney, blah, 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 hundreds of channels, hundreds of YouTube channels, hundreds of this, hundreds of that. And when I was on, there wasn't hundreds. There was pretty much just us. That's why we did well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it was the show. I mean, that was the kids show of my childhood. I know I wanted to be a contestant on there and all my friends did. Um, why do you think it did so well? Because as you said, it ran for 10 years. It was really popular. Yeah, I think it did so well because it was everything that a kid wanted. It was on a Friday afternoon, so perhaps they didn't have to do their homework straight away. They could, um, you know, dislodge that until Sunday and they could chuck their school bag down. I mean, people say to me, I used to run home from school to watch your show. And of course, nobody runs anywhere to watch anything now because they just uh, Sky Plus it or whatever. You know, it's all available on demand. Or watch it on the phone, yeah, or the, yeah. whatever device they've got with them. Yeah, you watch when you want. And uh, But um, it, it was a show that was very bright. It was very brightly coloured. It was... Um, it was very messy. There was gunge and there was uh, uh, school kids in the audience cheering and screaming for their favourite team, red or yellow. And it was just a great start to the weekend. And I made it very exciting as the host. That was my job to get in there and say, you know, it had, it had incredible energy. Um, perhaps a lot more than I'm showing tonight. But, um, it, did. it did. I always remember when, um, when the kids or the audience were cheering for their um, team, red or yellow, it was so loud that you couldn't really distinguish between what people were saying. It was like this blur of radio. Rello, Rello, Rello. And it, of course it had that really catchy theme tune, didn't it? I don't know whether you cared to uh, sing us a little bit, Pat. Well, um, I'm not a great singer, even though I did have a few chart hits as well, but that's fine. Yes, you did. You had yeah. three. I'm going to chat about that in a minute. But oh yeah, Fun House had this great theme tune, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was a fun house. It's a whole lot of fun with prizes to be won. It's a real wacky show where anything goes. 
Um, what are the twins doing these days? You're still in touch with them, aren't you? Yeah, love the twins. Get on really well with Melanie and Martina. They they came to a, a gig of mine a few weeks ago, actually, before all this uh, blew up with coronavirus. And um, they just came along and they, they weren't paid, but they just came to have some fun, and see me, and they put their their little pom-poms, they bought all their yellow and red outfits and they were aged 48, dancing up and down next to me while I was while I was DJing and uh, people absolutely loved it. They were going, oh my God, it's the twins. Oh, that's hilarious. Oh my God. And um, how has um, Kids TV changed since, you know, the fun, um, the fun house days through to now? How's it evolved? I would say it's dramatically changed, but then again, you, you might find this not too odd. I don't watch Kids TV. <laughs> and to be honest with you... Yes. You are now a granddad. You're a granddad, aren't you? So you will be watching kids' TV in about a year. Because how old is is Kaya now? Uh, Kaya is going to be one year one year old next month. Okay, so give it like a year. You will be watching kids' TV. We can have this chat in a year's time. You will reel off the programs that she likes to watch. Well, she's already into um, really into the Incredibles and Frozen. That's the thing she absolutely adores. And when we FaceTime her. She was going, hi, Diane. She's just going, because she's watching the, 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 the movies and she's more into those. But we have to literally turn off the movie to get her attention. Oh, but yeah. it's great to be able to, uh, to have FaceTime if you've got a, you know, a relative, a little kid in another country. It's great because obviously oh my gosh. You know, we, can't, we can't even see her and hug her on her first birthday when we were meant to be going there. You know? Oh, I'm so sorry. When did she turn one? It's next month. She turns one on May the 13th. Oh, wow. Well, my, my big girl turns 12 on May the 29th. And you know what? I feel your pain, Pat, because we're in a similar situation. My parents are obviously back in Yorkshire, and they were supposed to be here now for Sophia's birthday, so that's not going to happen. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's really testing. But, you know, the technology, what we're talking on right now, um, how much of a difference is that making to you right now, having family abroad in particular? Well, it's an extraordinary difference, and I will say that obviously, with with the fact that there is, uh, you know, coronavirus, so you can't physically go and see people, it's made an amazing difference. That's what I mentioned earlier about the fact that obviously uh, companies that are putting together videos, like for example, Zoom or Skype or whoever it is, are probably making a lot more money than they would have made through something that is actually so terrible as coronavirus. So, you know, for some companies, there is a chance to to uh, to make hay while the sun doesn't shine. And, um, but also, one thing I have found interesting with these things over the years, any kind of video, is that I cannot believe that we could sit here and talk now and, uh, and chat away like this, and yet it's absolutely free. It's never cost anyone money to do this, and FaceTime and anything, and uh, you know WhatsApp video. It, it doesn't matter what system you are. If someone had said, I'm going to let you speak to your granddaughter and you're going to be able to see her. People would have paid fortunes for that. And yet it's never cost money. So I don't know why. I know it's crazy. And um, I know we use WhatsApp video to sleep with my parents. And, you know, if that was, if that wasn't free, there's no way we'd speak to them the amount of times that we do. So yeah, it's, um, it's a great invention. We are not complaining. No. Um, talk to me a little bit about the TV side of things. We've mentioned radio and to an extent, you know, a lot of my colleagues um, back in the UK um, are, you know, broadcasting from home, and it's easier when it's radio. Talk to you about TV, though. Um, you know, how has the TV industry had to adapt to this situation right now? Well, there are a lot of television shows, <coughs> excuse me, that aren't being made now. So, for example, I believe there's only, <coughs> I believe there's only a few weeks left of East Enders and Coronation Street, and then they don't have any more in the can and they can't make any more. So they've been made up front, but now they are running out of programs. They had a program on last night called The Big Night In, and it was to raise money, uh, obviously for charities and to, uh, to help uh, corona coronavirus victims, I believe. And um, it was hosted with presenters who were standing, you know, one here, one there, and then one there. Um, I don't know how the camera operators work and the sound. I know a lot of things that even if you go to news channels these days, um, a lot of the cameras are remote, so you don't need to have a person there. So you can still do television shows, but they're, they're all lacking the atmosphere of a live audience. And um, yeah. it's, it's noticeable, isn't it? 
It, very noticeable. Um, it's funny because um, some of the late night um, comedy shows here, um, Bill Maher, Stephen Colbert, um, they're great shows. I love watching them. However, there is not a live audience right now. And even though these comedians are doing a great job considering the situation, it just kind of falls flat. I mean, you know, how important is a live audience? Um, you know, you've obviously, you're always performing in front of audiences. So what do you get from an audience as a performer? Well, you get the buzz, you get the feedback, you get the whole notion of the fact that you're doing a good job. And if they're not there, it is more difficult. But then again, you know, from doing radio and stuff, if you're speaking into a microphone, it's very much one to one and you don't have a huge crowd and you shouldn't say, you know, like, hi, everybody. How are you doing tonight? Because it's not. It's hi. How are you tonight? And it's personal, isn't it? It's one to one uh, talking to picturing somebody who is that person and then from that um you know you talk to them and, and they try and, and get the vibe hopefully they get the vibe from what you're saying but it, it's uh, it's quite an art to be able to do that and a lot of people on television who make the uh the crossover to radio perhaps find that a little more difficult because they haven't got um you know all these people around them and directors and producers and sound men and lighting guys and sometimes the studio audience they've just got a microphone and they're going Hello? Hello? Anyone there? <laughs> so that's interesting because you and I both started in radio and actually one of the first lessons I learned about radio was that you are broadcasting to one person. It's not a wide audience. You know, you just pretend that you're just broadcasting to a person to make it very personal. But you, like me, who've also worked for the BBC and commercial um, radio stations and TV stations um, in the UK. And what do you like and dislike about kind of working for the Beeb compared to a commercial station? Well, I think I don't really like or dislike either. I think if I had a choice, I'd probably prefer to work at a BBC station, even though I work for commercial radio, because I wouldn't have to pay commercials. I find they actually get in the way. And I think that you know, I can have a better flow to my show if I wasn't going to a break. Because the whole idea of a break is that, yes, you have to do them because it's what pays for you to be on the air. But it, it's very important that you don't tell people that you're going to a break, that you actually throw forward to what's coming up after the break to give them a reason to stay with the radio station so that they keep listening. So uh, they're, they're quite annoying ad breaks in commercial radio, but they also pay my wages, so um, I have to deal with them. Yeah, it's a difficult one. I've got to say, I mean, I, I enjoyed working in both um, situations, but for me, the BBC, um, I just felt very well um, supported and I was allowed the time and space um, to work on projects and you don't necessarily get that in the commercial um, you know, side of things because, you know, as you've said, you know, they, they need to sell airtime. It's about kind of results um, as opposed to giving you that kind of time to put into something that's a longer project. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I think um, there are certain commercial radio stations that, that, that do put more into their shows and still win awards because they do make effort with it. But in general, a commercial radio station's job, certainly for a for a music radio station is just to play the hits and bash out the songs that they that they know their listeners like. And because they have to have perhaps nine or 12 minutes of advertising each hour, they need to make a damn good job of what they do in the remaining time to convince people to come to them as opposed to a BBC station, which wouldn't have any breaks. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair point. And you know what, I really learned the trade well um, during my time in commercial radio, so um, I'm forever grateful for that, for sure. In fact, you and I uh, last saw each other at a uh, commercial radio award ceremony. You were um, yeah. hosting an award, and I think, I, we, we were, we, I think we were a runner-up. <laughs> I think it was the IRN Awards, wasn't it? It was the IRN Awards, yeah. yeah. That five years ago but yes that was the last time you and I saw each other in person and um, but talking about hits and radio um you've actually had three top 40 hits in your time and, and I think this current climate um calls for you to re-release one of those uh, magnificent hits uh, with your fellow DJ friend um, Mick um and maybe you could you know create a charity single um, and raise money for the NHS what do you think I'm just floating an idea here Pat well, um, some people watching this in America may even know one of our hits because one of them was number one in Boston and number one in the whole of Boston by Kiss 108 in Boston for about five or six weeks. Which one? 
the cover of Odyssey song, Use It Up, Wear It Out. Oh, in fact, um, I was just doing a little research yesterday and I did, um, I did play a couple of those songs. Let's All Chant is my personal favourite. <laughs> okay, well, you're very kind. I mean, look, we made records for charity. They were for Capital Radio's Help a London Child Charity. They raised hundreds of thousands of pounds and we got a chance to record them and have them produced by Stock Aiken Waterman, so we were very lucky. Um, but, um, you know, as I say, one of them, actually, that one I mentioned to you because of the success in Boston, came into the Billboard Hot 100 as the hot shot debut of the week above Phil Collins and Sting. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. You've had a really varied career. I mean, so many highs. What's been the highlight so far? Well, the best highlights have been in my hair, but um, they've gone now, so. Um... <laughs> so once again, Pat, hang on, let's just hold it then. For our American friends, I strongly urge you to um, go and Google Pat Sharp mullet, because Pat is absolutely famous in the UK for sporting a mullet. Um, you've obviously had it chopped off now. When did you when did you have the cut? It was a while back, wasn't it? Oh, about a quarter of a century ago, yeah. But, okay, um, a couple of years yeah. ago. Years ago. But, uh, yeah, but back, back in the day, I was the Joe Exotic of my time. <laughs> yes, you were. Oh my gosh, the similarities are just rushing through my head right now. Yes, you were. Um, however, you know, now would be a good time, if you were to ever bring it back, to bring it back, wouldn't it? Because we can't get our hair done. So you want me to make my charity records again when I couldn't really sing properly and needed a lot of help from <laughs> auto-tune and also to grow my hockey hair back. Yeah, yes, I hand. do. Just, Pat, just two little things for your old friend Claire. Yes, I do want you to do that. All in the name of charity, of course. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to be I'm going to be 60 next year, so I need to make sure that I am uh, sensible for my age. Oh, don't be silly. You'll never be sensible. Um, but tell me about being um, a grandfather for the first time. What's that like? What do you do with Kaya that you wouldn't have done with your own kids? Well, uh, for a start, you can give her back because she's not yours. So you can have a little hug and go, thank you. But we never want to give her back because we never see her much because she lives in another country. So we went there when she was two days old. And, um, and Monica, my wife, has been, I think she went literally just jumped on a plane and said, I've got to go and see her this weekend. She just jumped on a plane and went for the weekend. So, you know, it's, it's difficult when, when, when a baby lives abroad, but we always get to see her normally at sort of bath time or dinner time and uh, sometimes during the day. And she does know us. I think she smiles. And, and it's quite funny because uh, my eldest, Nicky, our eldest, um, he looks a bit like me. And um, she looks at me sometimes on even on FaceTime and goes, and then she goes, die, 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 die. So she seems to think that I might be a, a different version of her da 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 da. So that's oh, quite that's so sweet. That is so sweet and a compliment too. Well, Pat, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you. As I said to you earlier, you've been a mentor to me for many years. So thank you for that. I really appreciate our friendship. And I hope that, you know, in a few weeks, months, whenever it's safe to go out, we can resume our daily lives and you can get to see Kaya as well again soon. No, thank you very much, Claire, and to you and your, your girls and uh, all your viewers and to, to Edward who helped put this uh, podcast together. I hope you all keep well and stay safe and um, we will all catch up when our lives are hopefully uh, better. But in the meantime, it's very important that we do stay home and stay safe. Absolutely. Uh, great words. Love to Monica and the family and you take care. And to you. Thanks, Pat. Bye. Bye for now.